Okay, so welcome to our presentation. We're going to be talking about steps to success in regards to music lessons, learning an instrument, and what you need to do as a parent to enable your child to succeed. So first of all, I'm going to get rid of some of these myths. Myth bashing time. None of these are true. Children should just practice without being asked. Well, if you are one of those lucky people that your child does that, well, you are seriously blessed because there aren't many of them. The only people that I know who were like that as children were my husband, who used to come home from school and run up and get his guitar and play away by himself. I was not like that. I was one of those that you had to force. And if my parents hadn't forced me, I wouldn't be here speaking to you now. So. If they don't willingly pick up their instrument or go to play it, then they obviously don't enjoy it. That's not true. It's just like anything, they have to be reminded. They won't necessarily think about doing it. And sometimes they won't feel like doing it because they're tired at the end of the day or in the morning. And so you have to encourage them. It is quite difficult sometimes to actually get people to want to do something when they're tired. But that doesn't mean that they don't like it just because you have to get them to do it. So you sometimes do, sadly, have to force your child to practice. And by force, I mean, if you put into place some procedures like we're going to practice at this time, we're going to practice on these days, so they know ahead of time that that's required of them. It's a bit like when we have homework or prep we know that we have French on Tuesday and we have maths on Thursday. So they know in advance what your expectation is of them and also what the teacher's expectation is. So if they don't practice, then they're not going to enjoy the lessons. And that is often why children give up because they feel scared of going to the lesson because they haven't done practice. And it's the most demoralizing thing when you get to the day before your lesson and you realise you haven't done any practice because you've forgotten and you don't want to do badly and you like your instrument but you have to suddenly then try and play it for half an hour or an hour and actually you don't have the stamina for that. So actually the practice doesn't really work out very well. So that tends to be a lot of the repetitive patterns that happen with children practising. They leave it till the day before but I have to say that for me, is mainly a responsibility of the parent, even when they're older. My son is in year seven, and if I don't remind him to practice, he won't practice. And he loves music, he loves his instruments, he's a music scholar, and sometimes he doesn't want to do it. And I have to say, look, you have to do it, it's your responsibility. I'm reminding you, I'm telling you to do it, but you have to do it, and I will even do it with you, but you have to do it. So, another myth. Piano is the easiest instrument or children should learn piano first. This has been something which throughout the ages people have believed that piano is easy. It's not easy. It's really hard. The only thing that's easy about it is making the actual sound. When you press the key on the piano, it makes a lovely sound. Whereas when you blow through a woodwind instrument or a brass instrument or try and play a string instrument when you're first learning, it usually makes a pretty awful sound. So that's the only thing that's easier about it. So, and also it, it just sits there in your house and they don't have to get it out. Those two things make it seem like an easy choice. And maybe parents might think it's an easy choice for them because they don't have to get it out. But it's very difficult for some children to play the piano because Sometimes a child looks at a piano and they see uh, millions of keys. It's not just like when you look at a trumpet, you see three. When you look at other instruments like a violin, it has four strings. You know, as a piano has 88 keys. So for some children, depending on their learning style, that's really hard. But not all children, because not all children are the same. Some children will start on the piano and they will love it, but then when they start to play hands together, it suddenly becomes much more difficult, which is why it's one of the hardest instruments. Two hands, two lines of music. Most instruments only have one line of music and don't play chords. Guitar is also quite difficult because guitar also, if you read music on the guitar, you have to also read chords. 
it's quite difficult. <coughs> and some instruments are more painful than others. Piano is not very painful. It's easy in that sense. But if you've got a child who is struggles with focus at all, the piano will not be for them until they get to a certain age where they've learned to adapt to their own learning style. If they can't bang a drum in time or sing in tune, they're not musical. That's also a myth that I just want to get rid of right now because children that have learning differences, like they might be dyspraxic or dyslexic, often find those sort of things really difficult. My son, who is now a great musician, he could not bang a drum in time until about a year and a half ago. So if he'd been with another music teacher who was a bit more traditional, she, they, they'd have thought that he, he didn't have a musical bone in his body because he could not play in time to save his life. And this was a sad thing that he couldn't do. But now he can because he's older and he's learned to adapt to his own abilities. Singing is another thing. Singing, there's a period of your child's development between around six months and 18 months when their musical ear, their, their understanding of pitch in terms of their hearing develops. Now, if your child has a cold during that time, their pitching ability will not develop in the same way. And this is usually the reason why children can't sing in tune, because that natural ability has been uh, stalled, in effect, by the fact that they had a cold when they were naturally developing in that way. And it can happen any time between six months and 18 months. So the chances are every child has a cold at some point between those two age groups. And so they can learn to sing in tune. But they, if they don't do it naturally, that doesn't mean that they're not musical or that they can't sing in tune. It just means they have to learn how to do it rather than it just being something that just happens. So there's so many reasons why people think that they themselves are not musical or why they think their children are not musical. So let's get rid of those myths. And I cannot help my child to practice because I'm not musical. That's the saddest one of all. <laughs> now, maybe your reason for thinking you're not musical is because you were one of these children that couldn't sing in tune when you were little or something like that. Or maybe you just didn't have the opportunity to find your own instrument. That's mainly the reason I believe everybody can play musical instruments. Maybe not everybody could be a professional musician, but everybody can play. So finding the right instrument for your child is one of the most important things. All children are different and all instruments are different. So the chances are not all instruments will match all children. And yet a lot of children have been just put on piano or they've chosen guitar or violin because that's all they know. So that's what they want to play or their friend does it or they want to be a rock star. That's the other one. But unfortunately, it doesn't always work out that way. If they are not ready for that instrument or if it's not the instrument which they have the greatest aptitude for, then they won't excel. Age appropriate instruments. Sometimes it's just too early for a child to play a certain instrument, particularly some of the woodwind instruments like flute, oboe, bassoon. Bassoon is very large and if they can't uh, stretch the fingering they won't be able to do it. Trombone is also very large. If they're not big enough to play all the way down to the lower positions then they'll be trying to play like that and it will have a negative impact. Even recorder which everybody thinks oh little kids should play recorder. Well actually if you've got really small little skinny fingers and you try and play the recorder you won't be able to cover the holes. And so you will think that you're no good at music. And so many children get put off because of that kind of thing. So music is for everyone and it's never too late to learn. So sometimes we have children who are like in year seven or even year eight and they don't play an instrument. It's not too late and it's not too late to take a second instrument if you already play one. So for instance, we've, we've just had an exploring instruments course, which I know some of you have done, where we've had children from year one to year eight take it and they've explored every instrument so they get a, a, a trial on every single one so that they can really see how good they are at them and how, how they like the sound, that kind of thing. And the teacher writes an aptitude report 
based on how, they, how well they are um, kind of suited to that instrument. And then we feed that back to help them decide which instrument's for them. And we've also got a lot of children which have done that to find a second instrument. Gifted children and music scholarships. If a child has musical aptitude, we do encourage them to do a second instrument because if they're looking at doing a music scholarship, they need to play an orchestral instrument in addition to another instrument, which could be piano, it could be guitar, it could be drums, but they need to play an orchestral instrument. So flute, oboe, clarinet, bassoon, anything, cello, violin, anything that is in an orchestra. It's very important because I've been meeting with a lot of directors of music and this is what they're talking about, that we need an orchestral instrument as well. It's, it's crucial. Sometimes children <coughs> do so well that they might want to play a third instrument. Now, this is also possible, but we also advise not to do too many at once. So, for instance, if your child's already excelling on, on one instrument, then to add two more at once is probably not advisable. It's good to build up slowly. Uh, but we have had, uh, you know, examples of where a child that plays a woodwind instrument such as oboe has then picked up the saxophone and because the fingering is exactly the same, they can suddenly play the saxophone like a dream. And they've gone from having never played the saxophone to getting their grade four distinction in like five months. So playing one instrument does often lead to being able to easily play another instrument. And it's the same with reading music. Once they've learned to read music, any child that's learned to play the piano and read music, when they take up another instrument, will be flying because it's so much easier to read one line of music. So the benefits of a second instrument is that if you play piano, sight reading is always difficult. So if you're playing piano and then you take up the cello or the bassoon or an instrument which reads the bass clef, a trombone, then automatically, your ability to read the bass clef, which is something that a lot of children struggle with, will increase. And the same with obviously the treble instruments. So it's just a way, another way of really building on their musical skills, as well as giving them that extra uh, string to their bow, so to speak. <laughs> so learning an instrument with learning differences. Now, I mentioned my son. So many children have learning differences. They might be dyslexic, they might be dyspraxic, they might have ADHD, they might have um, ASD or autism. That doesn't mean that they can't learn an instrument. And actually, it usually pays dividends to their self-esteem. Because there is no reason why a child with any of those learning differences can't excel as a musician. And often, when they find that they have a gift, that they are really talented in something, then they can put a lot of energy into that. So it's really important that if your child has dyslexia or, or something which you feel means that they need to be in the classroom more, that they don't actually lose this opportunity. Because even if they come out of lessons, if they learn one instrument, it's only once a week. And there is sometimes, if they learn two instruments, the opportunity to try and have a fixed lesson or even to take lessons out of school. So all of these things are, you know, optional. So, how to make your child's practice successful? Well, practice is the only way. So little and often wins the day because you need to build stamina. Now, obviously, if your child is going for grade five, then the amount that they practice needs to be a lot more than if they're going for grade one. If they're a beginner, then practice is, looks very different. When someone's in the early stages, and even when they're not, we need to make the instrument accessible for them. So, for instance, if they're playing an instrument needs to be put together, then let them leave it out. Don't insist that they put it away. If you've got space and they play the cello, don't put the cello away in the case. If they play the flute, don't put the flute away. Leave it out so they can just go and pick it up. And if they play an instrument which, you know, needs a chair like a cello, then have a chair set up ready for them. Make sure if they play the cello that they have a rug or a spike holder so that you put the spike of the cello in so that the cello doesn't keep slipping away from them. Otherwise, they're, they're sort of set up to, to, to fail if you don't do that. 
So we, we need to make sure that we set them up to succeed. And this is like one of the most important things really, that we set our children up to succeed with the practice. So be present and be patient. Be interested in your child's music lesson. Go and sit with them, hear how they're doing. Even if you're not a musician, just show them that it's important what they're doing. Why not learn with your child? Learn the musical instrument. If a six-year-old can do it, I'm sure you can. <laughs> Make it fun and enjoyable experience for everyone. Obviously, when there's something like an exam coming up, sometimes it does get stressful and there is pressure. But I'm a great believer in you need pressure in order to produce diamonds. That's how diamonds are produced, under pressure. And we want our children to be diamonds. <laughs> So we want them to shine. I'm not a musician. Oh, how can I help? Who's a musician here? Anyone? Oh, we've got lots of musicians. Who's not a musician? There we go. So you can arrange to attend your child's music lesson occasionally. So this is easy. You just, um, I mean, we're trying to dissuade people from just showing up. It's better if you just go and register in the normal way and arrange it with the teacher so that you can go to the music lesson and check how they're doing, especially in the early stages. If your child's happy and getting on fine and it's all going well and they're excelling, then there might not be a need for it. But it can be a really informative thing to go and just see your child in the music lesson occasionally. <coughs> Some teachers really encourage that. Others not so much, but I'm sure, you know, in the early stages that they see the benefit of actually having the parent there. So the parent can see how to help the child. That's what it's for. So if your child is just starting a new instrument and they don't know how to put it together, you will need to help them. They won't just be able to do it by themselves. And you can use YouTube videos, that kind of thing. They're a great reminder. We're, we're in this age where everything we need to know is on YouTube. We can just find out how to put a clarinet together on YouTube. We can find out what, we can even find out how to tune a violin on YouTube. I wouldn't recommend it, but uh, you know, and also I'm here, we're here. There's lots of people that can help. If your child plays the violin and it's gone really out of tune, then get her to bring it in the next day and I will tune it or one of the other teachers will tune it. We're here to help. Make them a practice schedule that rewards them for their efforts. Give them rewards. You know your child. You know what kind of rewards they want. <laughs> so give them incentives to practice. I'm actually going to create a practice card where they will actually get house points for all the different practice sessions that they do. So if they practice three times a week, they get a house point. If they practice four times a week, they get two house points. If they practice five times a week, they get three house points. So it really is going to be a cumulative thing. And I just encourage you to do the same thing. So yeah, making the instrument accessible or putting the instrument together for them if needed is really important, especially in the younger stages. So what is music practice? <coughs> just getting your instrument out and playing it is not practice. I had a mum recently who said to me, but he's always playing it. He's always playing the clarinet. How can you say he's not practicing? Well, practice is unfortunately not as much fun as just playing your instrument and playing through the piece. It is literally finding that bit that you're not playing very well and playing it over and over again until it gets better. For example, on the piano, when you're playing a, a piano piece that's moving from one part of the piano to the next, you will always have this hesitation or this pause where you look for it. You actually have to practice that bit, <coughs> finding the new notes. And it's the same when you're playing a woodwind instrument and you're trying to do a difficult fingering. You have to practice getting to that fingering. So if you're not a musician and you don't know how, how a piece is supposed to sound, look it up on YouTube. <laughs> it's a great resource. So practice looks different as your child progresses. At the very beginning, just holding the instrument in the right place, having a good posture and making a sound for five minutes. That's practice for a, a beginner. And this should be five times 
five times a week for five minutes. That's enough. Communicating regularly with the teacher, using a notebook or phone or email so that you know what they need to do. <coughs> a notebook is a traditional way, but it does work. So if your child goes to a music lesson with a notebook, the teacher will use it. The amount of teachers that say, oh, he never brings a notebook. But if he doesn't have a notebook, he's not going to bring one. So you need to actually organise them with a notebook. Don't be afraid to ask the teacher if you don't understand what they've got to do. They are employed by you as parents to teach your children. So that means that you have a right to actually communicate with them and ask them what they need to do if you don't understand what they need to do. If your child doesn't understand, then I'm sure that they're not going to be able to communicate it to you. So it's always good to say, do you know what you've got to do this week? Do you know what your teachers asked you to practice? You don't have to be a musician to ask these questions. It's not just playing a piece from start to finish. It's playing little sections. They will always just want to play it from start to finish and they'll play it several times. And then they'll be like, all right, I'm done. My practice is finished. And it's not about perfection. It's about improving on what they've done. And just playing it through from beginning to end is not going to really improve what they're doing. They need to work on little bits. And also, phrasing of music is really important. You can actually just sing the tune. OK, so you can sometimes get your child to sing it, or you can sing it with them so that they can understand, actually, ah, that's where the phrase ends. Because they often, they see bar lines in music, and they think that a bar line is the end of a section. Now, I think to get rid of bar lines altogether, for, particularly for beginners, would be a great improvement, because kids would start to play with a lot more natural feeling and with rhythm. Because when they see a bar line, they sort of stop or hesitate. It's like an excuse for a pause. <laughs> so it's really important to sometimes sit there and, and you can see they're playing a note, they're playing the next one, and then there's a bar line. But they shouldn't be stopping there, they should be going straight on to the next bar. So when they're playing, you'll be able to hear whether or you're a musician or not, whether or not it sounds good or not, okay? Now, if there's something that they're playing which sounds pretty good and then you hear a bit which isn't very good, you need to go to them and say, when they keep playing that bit and it's not working, look, I think you need to practice that bit. Can you just show me where it is? And then you need to actually say to them, right, do you know where that bit is? Because so many times when children are playing a piece, they won't be really looking at the music. They won't know where they are in the music. And when you ask them to play just that little bit, oh, can you play that little middle section again? The chances are they will say, oh, I'll just play it from the beginning. Or they'll just play it from the beginning anyway. That means they don't know where they are in the music. So you can sit there and follow it with them. Okay, most pieces are in four time or three time. And you can actually count the beats with them. Ask them to explain it to you. Then they'll feel like, wow, they're teaching their mum something or they're teaching their dad something. Then they might realise that actually they haven't got that bit quite right because they don't know where it is. It's important not to practise your mistakes. This is one of the main things that I have with my son. He'll play the piece and he'll keep playing the same mistake over and over again. And so what happens then is they learn a mistake. And it's so difficult then to get them to play it without that mistake because they've literally it's become part of the piece. So you need to listen. And as soon as they, you've heard them like five times playing the same sort of bit, which sounds a bit weird, then you need to say to them, look, I know you're playing that wrong. I might not know how to fix it, but you need to not play that bit until you go back to your lesson. If we, you can't fix it with them, they need to not play it until they go back to the lesson. And a lot of the pieces are on YouTube. So you can Google it yourself and say, look, this is how it goes if you're not a musician. And just get them to listen to it and say, look, it's like <coughs> this. You can video or record your child so that they can hear what they look and sound like. 
because sometimes they have no idea. So if you can see that your child's playing an instrument and they've got a really bad posture and they're playing like this, then video them, show them. I'll never forget when I was learning to ski and the instructor kept telling me, but you're not looking down the slope. And I'm like, I am. And he said, you're not. And then when he filmed me, the slope was there and I was looking over here. <laughs> I was like, oh, I never believed it. I just, I was so sure that I was doing it right. And it wasn't until I saw myself on video that I realised. And I'm always telling children, backs of chairs are not for your back. When you're playing an instrument, you shouldn't be leaning on the back of the chair. You should be sitting with your feet firmly on the floor and your back straight and a gap between you and the back of the chair. That's how they should be sitting, whichever instrument they're playing. And actually some instruments, it's better if they stand to practice. All important add-ons, taking part in school musical groups. So instrumental groups in school, singing in a choir, all of these things will really, really benefit them and help them progress. Without playing with other children, they won't really get the feeling of what it is to play in time, because especially pianists, they are the most unrhythmic in performance often, because unless the teacher plays with them, they just don't have that momentum to keep going because they're not playing with anyone else. Whereas when you play with someone else, you have to keep going. And it's another great thing about sight reading. Sight reading is one of the hardest things. When you're sight reading in an orchestra, you learn how to keep going. When you're sight singing in a choir, you can't just stop when you get to a bit you don't know. You kind of have to guess it. And so eventually you get better. That's one of the reasons it's so important. And I know some people really struggle with sight reading. I really struggle with sight reading. I didn't, I was terrible at sight reading on the piano and I only got better when I was forced, it's that word again, forced, when I was forced to a company actually here at Homewood House when it was my first job. And I had to play for hymn practice. And I'd never played in hymn practice. I'd never played that kind of thing on the piano ever. And my sight reading wasn't very good and there was loads of hymns to play. And I was like, how am I gonna learn all of these? But eventually I got really good at sight reading. <laughs> I'd just start by doing just the bass and the treble and I'd miss out all the chords. And eventually I was able to do it. But I wasn't a natural sight reader. I wasn't someone that could even sing when I was little. I was one of those people that my mum had to teach me how to sing. I was one of those children who had probably suffered with a cold during that developmental stage when I didn't get my hearing of pitch. And so when I was five or six, I was really out of tune. They didn't let me in the choir. And now I'm a professional singer and I'm teaching your children how to sing. So there's always hope. Learning music theory is really important. Now, it's not the most exciting thing for a child, but it will help them understand what they're reading. So when they're reading music, it's like another language. And especially if your child's dyslexic, they are gonna really struggle with sight reading. And it doesn't mean that they won't be able to do it. They will be able to read music whether or not they will be able to be really great at sight reading is another thing. But sometimes we're putting unrealistic expectations on our children. Sight reading is something that happens in exams and we do have to try and improve that. But it's not the be all and end all. And we'll get a bit more on sight reading in a bit. So music exams, they're great. They encourage your child to uh, really work towards a goal. You can completely have a great time on your instrument without doing any exams. I'm not saying that exams are the only way, they're not. But they do give a good goal and a good indication of your child's progress. I'm an advocate for exams, but it's not for everybody. So, I mean, my, my son, he hasn't done any piano exams except for grade one because his level of performance is so much higher than his ability to read music or his ability to play scales. And so I've said, okay, we won't do piano exams, 
we will just do French horn exams and cello exams. And he is doing singing exams, but he's doing the digital exams, which I'll talk a bit more about in a minute. So performing regularly, it's really important, even if it's just performing to you at home. We have weekly performances here in the, in the foyer, good morning performing, and it really does raise the spirits of the day and gives your child an opportunity to perform in an informal setting where they can perform to their teachers, their friends and to you without having you know, too many people there so they can just get used to performing. So I encourage everyone to get their children to sign up for Good Morning Performing. We also have obviously uh, the bigger concerts, that kind of thing in the theatre where they can perform. And we also get them to perform with the groups, with the orchestras, with the choirs. We're in the process of setting up lots of other ensembles as well. Holiday music courses. Now holidays, we all love holidays, but the amount of instruments that get left here over the summer, it's really tragic. I started here um, in September, but before September I came in over the summer to, you know, familiarise myself with the school and set up things in the department. There were so many instruments. I was like thinking to myself, are these school instruments or do they belong to people? And about half of them were the instruments that were left there by people who just didn't practice over the summer. And that is sad. So one way to ensure that that doesn't happen is to send your child on a music course over the holiday. Now, there's some great courses run by <coughs> Kent Music at Benenden and there's other, other music courses as well. And they're really amazing. My son's going to be going to one at Easter, brass course, uh, which is not at Benenden, it's another one. But there's so many. We don't do them here at school because there's so many to choose from already. So I do advocate doing that. It will make sure that your child doesn't just put her flute down or her oboe or her trumpet or her guitar at the end of uh, June and not pick it up again until September. Because it, it's not like starting again, but if you're a beginner, it'll be like starting again. Family music or showtime. So if you're not a musician, you can be the audience. If you are a musician, then you should also be playing to your children. So have a little event in your house. Invite your friends. You know, one of the things that really encouraged me when I was little, I used to hate practice. I hated it so much. My mum used to make me, she forced me. And I'm so grateful <laughs> because if she hadn't, I wouldn't be here talking to you. My piano was in a cold, dark, haunted room in the worst part of the house. And we lived in a big old house. So this is one of the worst places to have the piano, which you were supposed to practice on. To go in there was creepy and scary and freezing cold. You, it's not <coughs> setting you up for success. And yet somehow I still made it because my mum forced me. But the one saving grace was that we also used to have our house, it was a bit like a hotel. So she used to have people coming and staying. And so I used to play for the breakfasts. So I used to sit there and perform for them and they'd give me money. It was amazing. What a great incentive. <laughs> so create these opportunities for your children. They will thank you for it. Now, exam preparation. Exams are important. They're not the be all and end all, but we need to make sure our children are set up for success. So oral skills. Singing is part of being a musician. Now it's really important that children who are learning an instrument also sing. Now some of them are really resistant to singing, but that can be for a, a variety of ways. Uh, it can be for a variety of reasons, and it's usually because they're not confident. But they're not going to get any more confident by not doing it. And that means that when it comes to doing oral in their exam, they are not going to get very high marks. And so all that work on the pieces is going to be affected by their singing and that's a shame some children get really demoralized by the fact that they they feel like they've done really well they come out of their exam and they feel like they've done brilliantly and then when they get their marks they've only just passed 
and this could be because of the oral, the sight reading. So at least we need to encourage them to develop this part. Now we have choirs in the school, they can all join choirs. We do singing in, in class as well a lot. We have a whole, whole year group choirs as well. So hopefully they are all doing singing. But the more they can do, the better. Sight reading, as I was saying, it's the most difficult part of being a musician for most people. Now, one thing you can do to encourage the sight reading, if you want to get your children to practice <coughs> sight reading at home, is to actually put on a metronome at a slow speed, but get them to play just something very simple that they're reading. Sight reading tests are simple compared to the level that your child is playing. If your child is on grade three, then they will be sight reading a grade one type piece. That's how it goes. If they're on grade five, the level will be grade three of the sight reading. So they, they just need to be able to play in time. That's the most important thing. It's much more important than playing the right notes. If they play, lots of wrong notes but play in time they will get a better mark than if they play all the right notes but there's no but there's no rhythm okay timing is the most important thing all right so rhythm maketh music <laughs> i actually do a, a test with my students i play happy birthday to them but i play it with no rhythm i just play the notes without any rhythm playing some really fast some slow and then I play the rhythm of happy birthday, but like kind of with my arms on the piano. <laughs> so it's like a big mishmash of notes. And I say to them, tell me what I've just played. They always get it when I play the rhythm of happy birthday, but they never get it when I just play the single notes with no rhythm. So that just goes to show that rhythm saves the day. So scales, a fishy business. So scales, they are, helpful. When your child learns scales, it, it will in, increase their ability to, one, know all the keys. So when we learn music theory, we have to learn the different keys that music's in, like it's in C, it's in D, it's in E. And so therefore they will immediately start understanding that a lot better by playing scales. Scales can also um, be useful because a lot of pieces use scales. So if you've got a, a, a run on your instrument, like a, um, a clarinet or a flute, and you're, you're playing some fast notes, those fast notes will probably be part of a scale that you've already learnt. Piano, scales help with the fingering. But I will say that sometimes children can't play scales on piano, particularly. The piano scales are very hard, which is one of the reasons that my son is not learning um, exam repertoire for, for this reason because he doesn't he can't really play scales because of his dyspraxia it's very difficult for him and so whilst he can on a single line instrument such as the cello he's playing scales the french horn he's playing scales piano is much more difficult not basic scales yes but for piano you have to do contrary motion um, even when they get to grade six they have to play like in thirds in one hand it's very difficult so this kind of thing can really um, be prohibitive uh, to some children. So that's why there's also the option of doing a digital exam. So a digital exam is a, a performance exam rather than an exam with scales. So for the performance exam, you just play pieces. You don't play, you don't do any oral or sight reading or scales. So it is an option. It's not an option I advise everybody to do because I think that to not learn those other aspects of music means that they're missing out. The only time I would advise people to do the performance exam is if they're really struggling with those aspects to such a great extent that it's holding them back. You know, if you, if you want to do grade seven and you can't sight read, then there's no way that you're gonna do it. You're gonna drag your mark down so much but if you're a brilliant performer, then why not do your grade seven? Just do a performance exam. So my son's doing that for his grade seven singing, but he's a much lower grade on cello and on French horn. So he's doing all of the normal stages for the exam. So it's always good to do a mixture. With, with the performance exams, the way it works is that 
they perform and we film it. And we are soon going to offer that as a service as well. So exams are not necessarily always a good indication of your child's ability. We do have, unfortunately, often a bit of a, a difference between the examiner's marks from one examiner to another, which can be very disheartening. So whilst exams are important, and I would encourage children to do them, if your child does an exam and you know that they've done really well and they don't get a very good mark, <coughs> your child needs to also learn that, needs to learn the fact that sometimes people will say that they didn't like that performance as much as another performance that they did before. But it's all circumspective. You know, music is circumspective. Someone's performance might be completely different to someone else's. And singing is one of those things. Singing, your voice is your instrument. So it might be that one examiner particularly feels that this way of singing, with a very pure tone, is the way that he thinks that this song should be sung. But another examiner might think completely differently. And it's the same with any instrument. Some examiners, for instance, they don't like a breathy tone on the flute, whereas some will love that. And some will require that for this kind of piece, you play with a different tone to this piece and, and this kind of thing. So there is not a hard and fast rule with these examiners. So you have to take that into consideration when your child gets a mark. And um, you know, just always encourage them that they did their best, but maybe this time, you know, there could have been other circumstances. It's important that they don't feel discouraged. Great. Well, I'm going to be around for a few minutes if you want to ask me anything just on a one-to-one. -one. You can have more tea and biscuits if you like. But thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.